Hi, I'm Radine. Welcome to Life Sciences. Today we're going to be looking at hominid evolution. So let's take a look here. All right, so the first question I'd like to ask you is, what does your family tree look like? If you have a look here, um, we, this is a family tree that shows, well, kind of a family tree that shows um, how organisms have evolved. So we start off here at the bottom of the trunk, um, down at the ground, where we have the first, uh, mo more simple forms of life. And as the branches go upwards, we become, the life forms become more and more complex until we see this is where you are over here. All right, so the concepts, or let's have a look at the topic, and we can see we're going to ba basically be talking about hominid evolution, and we're going to look at key biological concepts. Remember, terminology is key uh, always, because if we understand the terminology, then um, you know we can then understand what the questions are asking us. We understand the concepts, etc. All right, so we're going to have a look at that. Then we're going to have a look at um, our place in the animal kingdom. We're going to have a look at how we interpret a phylogenetic tree, which is a very important um, aspect. And then we're going to have a look at characteristics that humans and apes have in common. We're going to look at the differences that they have and the advantages of bipedalism. So there's quite a bit of information here. All right. Okay, so the first key word that we're going to look at is common ancestor. Okay, and if we break up that term, we see common um, means where we have things that are similar or the same, and then ancestor is somebody that we have descended from. So basically, it's an, an ancestor that two or more descendants have in common. So they share that ancestor. Right, the next term we're going to look at is fossils, and we did cover this in previous lessons uh, where we spoke about fossils, and fossils we also covered when we were in grade 10, and basically fossils are the mineralized remains of organisms that have lived in the past. Okay, so they come from the past and they then um, are preserved as fossils, and we can study them today. All right, um, the next key word we're going to have a look at is extant. Now, we don't often use it, but when we're looking at um, descendants and, you know, organisms that have descended from others, we want to have a look and see if they are still in existence. So, for example, um, the human homo sapiens, human race, is, is extant because we are still in existence. Then the next, the opposite term is extinction. Okay, and here, this is where organisms have permanently disappeared um, from the earth. So those are species that are no longer in existence. Um, so they then lived in the past, and the way in which we learn about them is from uh, evidence, fossil remains, for example. Right, then two very important um, terms when we are studying human and hominid evolution, is these two. So the first one is hominid. And hominid, so it has a D at the end, um, is a biological group that includes modern humans, early human ancestors, as well as chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, orangutans, and those are then collectively known as apes. So that's hominids. That includes humans and apes um, that we have. All right, but the, the second term is hominins. Okay, and there you can see there's an N at the end. So it's slightly different. And that is a subgroup of hominids. And it only includes modern humans and early human ancestors. So it's different from hominids in that we don't have the great apes included in this group. All right, then <clears throat> we're going to have a look at the term homo. And the term homo, it's a Latin term, 
And basically it means human or it means man. Um, and then specifically Homo sapiens, uh, which is the, the species that we belong to, and it means wise human. So all humans living today belong to the same species, and that is Homo sapiens. And just to um, highlight here, that when we talk, when we name a species, we use italics. Um, and if you are not typing, then you're going to underline the words. So we would normally, if we're handwriting the names, then we would underline. And we always use a capital letter for the genus and a small letter for sapiens. All right, then some more key words. Primates, we've mentioned that already. Um, and here, this is a biological group, okay, that includes lemurs, includes baboons, chimpanzees, apes, and humans. So it's quite a big group. And as I said, um, so our, all our hominins would fit into the group of, of primates. All right, then paleontology, um, that's something we learned in grade 10. And basically, paleontology is the study of fossil remains. So those archaeologists or paleontologists that study specifically fossil remains, we call them paleontologists. All right, then we've got phylogenetic tree. And this is an important term. Um, it's where we have, um, we, we, it's our um, evolutionary diagram, and if we break the term up, so we have a look at the first part, it's phylo, and that means phylum group. Okay, so we have a look at groups uh, or phyla, and then the second part of the term is genetic, and that basically means relating to genes and origins. Okay, so that's actually quite a nice description of the diagram. And basically it's a diagrammatic representation, and what it shows is the possible evolutionary relationships amongst different species. So we can see how related, how closely related, or how um, um, far related organisms are if we have a look at the phylogenetic tree. Okay, so we've come to the end of this segment. We're going to take a short break now. See you after the break. Welcome back from the break. I hope you managed to get something to drink and perhaps stretch your legs. Okay, so let's have a look at how we interpret phylogenetic tree. Okay, so we've looked at our concept map again. We had a look at the key biological concepts. Um, we've had a look at what the terms mean, um, which are very important so that we understand the rest. And now what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at how we interpret uh, a phylogenetic tree. All right, so basically we said a phylogenetic tree indicates which ancestors gave rise to which descendants. Okay, so it's very important and it's very much like a family tree, uh, a phylogenetic tree, but there we include um, all sorts of organisms um, and we can go back millions and millions and millions of years um, and even billions of years to see uh, even back to where life first began. So a phylogenetic tree um, is like a tree. So we start at the bottom, usually at the base, at the roots, and then we move up the stem, and then as the branches, as it branches off, so the species or speciation occurs, and then we, we end up with different species. And we end up with the biodiversity that we know today. All right, so let's have a look. Okay, to help interpret this and any other phylogenetic tree because interpreting phylogenetic trees or diagrams is actually a skill and once you've learned this skill it doesn't matter which diagram they give you in the exams um, you know you would be able to so it wouldn't really matter what uh, question you are given what example you are given if you've learned the skill 
then you should be able to answer the question. So that's why it's very important to master the skill of interpreting phylogenetic trees. Okay, so let's have a look at how we're going to do it. So they say to us, use the following pointers. So the first thing is we look at the root of the phylogenetic diagram, and that represents the ancestor. So if we have a look at this diagram over here, we can see this is the root, okay? There we have the ancestor. And if we have a look at the, um, the arrow and the time scale on the side, here we can see we start at the past and we move up towards the more recent um, time. Okay, so that's the root. Um, and then the branches, those are the descendants um, of that ancestor. So they, in other words, came from that ancestor. So as we have a look here, we saw the ancestor and the tree kind of branches out over here, and it gives rise to two new uh, descendants. All right, so, and these descendants then, further speciation can take place, and we have more descendants forming each time. So when we have a look at um, the common ancestor. So if we have a look at this, we say the common ancestor, he, this person or this individual, this organism was the common ancestor of all of them. However, um, if I say this one here is also a common ancestor, but it's now no longer the common ancestor of species one, okay, because it's now um, branched off. So that now becomes a common ancestor of species 2, 3, and 4. If I go to this point over here and I have a look at the common ancestor, again, it's now no longer the common ancestor of 1 and 2, but it is the common ancestor of 3 and 4. Okay, so that's how we have a look at, uh, or we start looking at an ancestor, for example. Okay, so... And when we move upwards um, in the phylogenetic tree, it basically means we are moving forward in time. So we are moving to more towards the present. All right, so now um, we spoke of it, or we had a look at the, the common ancestor, and we had a look at the roots and where um, the, the other species branch off. But now we're going to have a look at speciation. Okay, and we've done, we covered speciation in previous lessons where we saw that when uh, a population is split into two and over time they change through natural selection and then become new species. So, so basically what we're doing here is we're having a look. Here's our ancestral lineage. So that's the ancestor. And then something happens here. And we call that a speciation event. And that speciation event caused... For some reason, the, this ancestral lineage was split into two groups. Okay, so they were split and they either by a geographic barrier or some kind of reproductive isolating uh, mechanism and that caused two new daughter lineages. So here we see we've now got two new lines and over time, because this is time, if we move from the bottom to the top, then we're going from the past and, we find, and we're moving towards the more recent times, um, and we find that then possibly as we get to the recent times, we would have now two different species. So this would be one, and this would be two. Okay, so we could see that they have changed. All right, so speciation is represented as branching of the tree. So a single ancestral population or lineage gives rise to two or sometimes more daughter lines depending on the, the separation or the speciation event that took place. Okay, so we've had a look at the ancestral population um, and we've seen you know, which, where, how we can have a look and find the common ancestor of various species on our phylogenetic tree. We also had a look and we saw that um, where they actually split, that is caused by what we call speciation events. 
and we did study speciation in previous lessons so we know that is where organisms or a population is split into two groups either by a physical barrier um, a geographic barrier or just simply that the organisms become reproductively isolated and we, we also study those um, mechanisms so it can either be that they reproduce at different times of the year or there's courtship behaviors or whatever okay so let's now have a look at um, what each lineage tells us okay so each lineage has a part of its own history that is unique and parts that are shared with other lineages okay and that's uh, so let's have a look here so we can see here um, here's our common ancestor would be here here's our ancestor and um, they all share okay they all share the common ancestor so this one here but as we move up here is a speciation event so that's where speciation occurred and we had the formation of species A and B. Okay, so we had A and B forming there. However, as we have a look at this daughter lineage here, we see that there's another speciation event that took place. Okay, so there we can see there's another speciation event that took place. So now we don't only have species A and B, but we also have species C. So let's have a look at what is unique to each and what is shared history. Okay, so if we have a look at the red line here, that is unique history to A. Okay, um, the dotted line here would be shared history of B and C. So in other words, they have a shared history. Um, and, and then what is unique to B would be what's in green and, and, and what is unique to C is what is in blue. Okay, so as we said, some lineages, there's unique history and some there is shared history. All right. Um, okay, so now each lineage has ancestors. Okay, so we already um, established that, that are unique. And then common ancestors that are shared with other lineages. So they have some that are just belong to them and then some that are unique. So if we have a look at the diagram here, again here we have this one is the common ancestor of A, B and C. So in other words, this was the, the, where the speciation event took place and that common ancestor was divided into two groups. Okay, so they split and we ended up with species A and over here we had the development of another species. And then we see that there was another speciation event and that common ancestor now was, or the, the species, that second group there was divided into two and they then became species B and species C. So what is the common ancestor then of species C? So it wouldn't be here. So this is, would be the common ancestor of all three, A, B and C. This one is the common ancestor of B and C because it's on this line. It's no longer linked to species A. And then this one here would be the common ancestor only of C because this line is no longer linked to species B. Okay. Right, now let's have a look at this diagram. This is an example um, and it's a simplified summary of the history of hominids and basically what we have a look here it's a very nice diagram because we can see there's a common ancestor we see there are descendants this is our timeline so it starts off at five million years ago and it moves forward um, to to the present where we are now and then we have a look here and we can see so we've got a lineage that then splits into two um, and then there's another speciation event there that happens. And so we get two new uh, groups and then we have changes and another speciation event and there's another branching off there. All right, and then we can also have a look at extinction um, that has taken place because some of the, you can see some of the organisms don't go all the way to the present. Okay, so let's have a look at 
oops, at the, at the specifics. Okay, so the diagram, in the diagram above, we can see um, Australopith Australopithecus afarensis. Okay, so there's Australopithecus afarensis, and they are the common ancestor of Homo habilis and uh, Australopithecus robustus. Um, okay, so, so that line there splits, and there, that's where Australopithecus afarensis is now the common ancestor of the two new groups. Okay, when the line forks or branches, so where it splits, um, speciation takes place, and new species originate. Okay, so there Australopithecus, we see there's a branching, um, and they then, you know, branched into Homo habilis, and Australopithecus robustus. Right, the organisms that existed when the line forked into branches is the common ancestor of that new species. So that is why we say Australopithecus is the uh, common ancestor to these two here. All right, when a line ends, it is the extinction of that specific species. Okay, and, we, and if you have a look, you can have a look um, in the DBE textbook, it explains it very nicely. And here what we see is that, um, for example, Homo robustus, let me just clear that and get it a little bit closer. Um, we can see the line, let's try and draw a line better. Okay, so where they end, so they didn't make it all the way to present time. So that species then has become extinct. Okay, so we can have a look at the timeline at the bottom. So it would be either on the x-axis or the y-axis, and we can then determine how old an organism is. So these are the kind of questions you would be asked. So for example here, Homo habilis, so let's have a look at where this speciation event occurred, and it's around about 3 million years ago. So you can be asked various questions. You can be asked about the descendants. So here is this common ancestor A would be the common ancestor of chimpanzees as well as Australopithecus afarensis, and in fact all of them, because the, this is before the branch split into any of these branches. Okay, and they would then, the rest, these two, then are known as the descendants. So the two branches then are the descendants. Um, okay, and then we can have a look, so they can say what occurred here, what occurred there, um, what occurred here, and those would be your speciation events. Okay, so all of these, um, this is what we can actually pick up from uh, a phylogenetic tree. And that's why I say, um, it's very important that we are able to interpret a phylogenetic tree and we, we learn the skill. So it's very simple. We find at the root of your phylogenetic tree we have the um, common ancestor. Then some kind of speciation event occurred that actually split that population into two. And when that was split into two we had the formation of new species. So we get new daughter lineages. Okay, and those daughter lineages, each time there's a speciation event that takes place and causes a fork in the branch um, and they split into two, then we get new formation of new species. And this is how we can actually work out then how related organisms are. Um, and as we go up the lineage or the line or the tree, we find common ancestors of organisms, but they might not be um, common to all the organisms in that phylogenetic tree, but they would then be common to certain of the organisms. And then we also saw that there's certain history that is unique to specific species, and then history that is common to all the species. Okay, so um, that's basically um, our interpretation of a phylogenetic tree. Okay, so we've come to the end of that segment, and I'm sure you guys are a little bit tired. We've been talking and we've looked at a lot of concepts, um, so we're going to take a short break. We'll see you after that.
Welcome back. Let's carry on with our lesson. Okay, so we've had a look at biological concepts. We've looked at how to interpret uh, a phylogenetic tree. And now what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at our place in the animal kingdom um, and where we fit in. Okay, characteristics also that we have that are common to humans and apes. All right, so let's have a look at this diagram. Um, we can see that um, it's the animal kingdom, so it's classification, and classification you learned um, in grade 10 and you learned in grade 11. You did a little bit of classification. So it's actually important that we know, we understand, and for grade 12 and for human evolution, you must know which family humans live in, uh, belong to, and you must also know um, the genus and the species. And not just for humans, for human ancestors as well. You must be able to name the genus and you must be able to name the species. All right, so let's have a look at this diagram here. Um, and we see, so we have the animal kingdom as opposed to the plant kingdom or fungi or monera or protista. Um, and we have a look at, we're going to look specifically at animals. And here's where we trace our lineage or our where we are, where humans are. Um, we fall under the category vertebrates, which means that there is a vertebral column. Or a backbone. Okay, so those are all organisms that are, have a backbone as opposed to our other organisms like insects and those kind of organisms that are invertebrates. Okay, then vertebrates are divided into five classes, you know that. Uh, where we have reptiles, we have fish, we have frogs, we have birds. But we're going to look at specifically the class mammals or mammalia. Okay, so we're part of mammals, the mammal group. Um, and that, uh, so that's, we, that's our class. Then we specifically fit into the order primates, as I mentioned previously. Uh, um, humans along with apes are found in the primates. So here we have humans um, and apes, the great apes. Okay, then our suborder is Anthropodia. And then we specifically belong, and this is where you need to know, is we belong to the family Hominidae. Okay, so we must know that name. We must know that we belong to the family Hominidae. And Hominidae includes orangutans, gorillas, chimps, and humans. So it's all of the apes as well as humans. So it is the hominids that we find in the family Hominidae. Homin Okay, right, um, okay, so the, as I've said, human evolution, you need to know the difference between a family name, a genus, and a species. Okay, now modern humans, they have the scientific name, so the scientific name of humans is Homo sapiens. Okay, now... Um, the word homo or the term homo means man and sapiens means wise. Okay, and this is where we have been named from. So those are considered part we, of the animal kingdom. All right. So the classification of, of humans is according to the Linnaean system. So it was Carl Linnaeus um, who, who um, developed this classification system. Um, and we can see on the next slide, we'll see this classification. Okay, so here we start off with the kingdom Animalia. So we said we fall under animals. The animal kingdom. In the class mammals, Mammalia. And very important to remember is that mammals have certain characteristics. And this is how we classify. We have a look at... Um, an organism and we have a look to see what characteristics they have and then see what characteristics they have in common with other organisms. And when we see that they have common um, characteristics, we can then classify them into a specific group. Um, and that's basically how um, scientists, biologists 
actually classify organisms, especially if they find a new species. Then they have a look to see uh, what characteristics it has in common with others, and then they would place them into a specific category. Okay, so here in the class mammalia, we say mammals, we know mammals give birth to live young, so that's the first characteristic. And then they also feed them on milk, so they are nourished uh, on milk. All right, so, um, and then we find organisms or um, humans are then in the order primates, and we spoke about primates. And the important thing, characteristic here, is they have an opposable thumb on a hand that has five fingers. Um, and it has fingernails, doesn't have claws, there are two eyes facing forward, etc. So there are lots of characteristics that then are unique to the primate group. And because of those characteristics, we are then placed into that order. The next uh, level of classification is family. Um, and there, we, as we said, we fall, fall into the classification of, uh, or the family of hominidae. Um, and this name you must know. Um, and it is humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans that be belong in this family. And then specifically our genus is Homo, which we said means man, and species, which is wise. So we belong in the Homo sapiens uh, group. Okay, so that's how we are classified. So we start at the largest group, um, and we look at the, the characteristics of the largest group. Then we move to the second group. So this would be the first group. This is the second group. Then we move on to the third group. So each time uh, we, the, the, we move down and, and move to another um, f uh, classification level, we then are getting more and more specific with the characteristics. So the characteristics then become more specific um, and so we, we make the groups or we um, define, if you like, the organism's classification. Okay, so here we can have a look at um, the hominin. Okay, and this is specifically because we said it's, uh, hominins are just um, humans. There are no apes here. Um, and if we have a look, this is the hominin family tree. It's a very simple version, and the nice thing about this diagram is it's drawn as a tree. So it represents, uh, it, we can see nicely, you know, the different branches and the different uh, species that we find that we need to study. And if we have a look on this side, on the, the left-hand side of the diagram here, um, we can see the time scale, and we start in the past, and it goes back as far as six million years ago, um, and then it goes up to today. Okay, so we have a look, as we said, in a phylogenetic tree, we start at the roots um, and we move up and each time there's a branching off, then that would be a speciation event. And here we find the Ardipithecus group um, of um, organisms or ancestors. Then we branch here and we find the Australopithecus group um, that are here and we're gonna study them. And then the branch carries on and we find the Paranthropus group, and then we find um, the Homo group. And we are at the top. And as you can see, out of all these species, none of them are on the um, present or on the line that indicates the present, except Homo sapiens. So all the other species on this diagram are extinct, and we are the only species that is extant. Okay. Right, now let's have a look at the characteristics that humans and apes have in common. Okay, so we can start, when we have a look, and it's very easy to, to study this or learn this, um, because it's quite important and you frequently are asked questions on it in the exams, but you start at the top. You can work your way down, it's your body um, that you know you can work it from, so you actually have kind of your crib notes with you. All right, so we'll start at the top and we have a look here at the head. And what we have is we have a large brain. It's much larger than other um, animals. So we have that in common. 
Then another feature that we have in common is that we have eyes in front. So in other words, our eyes face forward. And remember when we studied the eye, we learned that it gave us stereoscopic or binocular vision, which allows you to have 3D or depth perception. So your vision, you're able to then perceive um, depth, distance, and those kind of things. So um, that's another characteristic that we have in common. And then if we move down to the upper limb, so if we have a look here at the upper limb, um, we see that there's quite a few um, characteristics that we have in common. And the first thing is that we have freely rotating arms. So in other words, if we had to, we can actually move our arm around completely. It rotates, um, it's freely rotating, unlike other animals that would not be able to move their limbs in a 360 degree um, movement. All right, and then the second point that we, we have a look at, and yeah, we need to be specific because this is the whole arm, including the hand, is the upper limb. But we're looking at this only part of the arm, it's the upper arm. Okay, so we need to distinguish between that. So we have a long upper arm. So this segment uh, of the upper limb is our, of our arm is long. We also have rotation around the elbow joint. So in other words, we can move our arms. It gives us a little bit um, a more free movement, more dexterity that we can then maneuver, manipulate, handle, use um, tools and uh, whatever uh, implements that we have. Okay, so we have rotation around the elbows. We also then have bare fingertips. Um, and nails instead of claws so we don't have any hair or we don't have padding or anything like that on our fingertips we also have nails and we don't have claws um, so that's uh, uh, something that is in common and then the, the, the next thing on our upper limb that we have a look at is our opposable thumb and opposable means that it works if you have a look at your hand your fingers are sort of are facing this direction and your thumb in a different direction and it works opposite to your fingers. So we don't have a thumb here that's going to work in the same direction or the fifth digit is not placed here next to uh, your other fingers. So in other words it can help you to grip, it helps us with precision movement. I can pick up something um, and you know something small, uh, I can do small things. So basically um, sets us apart from other animals who don't have that opposable thumb. All right, and then the last thing that we have a look at is that we can we have an upright posture. All right, so let's have a look here. These diagrams are two here. This one shows nicely where we can see the hands um, are not padded, as well as we have so they bare fingertips and we have nails. Uh, instead of claws. Okay, so we can see bare fingertips and nails instead of claws. Um, and then, oopsie, sorry. And if we have a look at this diagram here, we can see that there's our opposable thumb. So us, as well as other primates, have that opposable thumb, and that then gives us um, that we are able to grip things, pick up things, hold things, um, gives us power and it gives us precision movement. Okay, and that, um, that basically uh, is different to if we have a look at the rest of the animal kingdom. Okay, so that's, we've come to the end of this segment. We're now going to take a short break um, and we'll see you after the break. Welcome back. Um, I hope you had enjoyed the break and that you are ready for the next um, segment of our lesson. Right, <clears throat> so what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the advantages of bipedalism. 
And we know that bipedalism means that it's organisms that walk upright, um, in an upright position, and they walk on their hind limbs all the time. Okay, so what are the advantages of bipedalism? Okay, there are several advantages. First of all, bipedalism um, allows us to free up our hands. So our hands now become free to pick up things, to carry things, to pick food, um, to handle food, to handle um, tools, to handle weapons, to carry in offspring, uh, whatever. Okay, so that's the first advantage. The second advantage is with us standing up, we, our eyes are higher off the ground. So now because we are in a higher, our, our eyes are in a higher position, we are able to see the surrounding area very uh, much better than if we were down. And, and if you can imagine, um, when humans first started with bipedal movement, the environment was grassland um, with trees and things, so that they would then be able to see um, predators or prey much easier from this vantage point. The third thing is that um, the movement becomes much easier. It's much more energy efficient to walk on two limbs and not on all fours. So um, that was, you know, the, the movement then allowed them to work, walk further distances or longer distances um, and move in that way. Right, the other thing about um, standing upright in a, in a bipedal position is that when you're in an upright posture, you're, the, there's less of your body surface exposed to direct sunlight. And that had the um, advantage of um, cooling down the body so that it was kind of a temperature regulating uh, mechanism. Also by lifting the vital organs that we find in the body um, off the ground where the heat is being radiated off the ground and then there's more air flow that could cool the body down. And then the last advantage um, is that in courtship behavior it allows for the sex organs to be displayed and um, organisms then would be able to um, find a mate. All right, so let's have a look <clears throat> at the anatomical differences. Now, obviously, when um, the posture and the position in which we move changed, there would be changes in the body structure. And that is what separates us to the, the rest of primates. Okay, so let's have a look. If we see on this diagram, we can see humans in an upright position, whereas um, other primates are in a quadrupedal. So we talk about they're walking on four limbs. So that's a quadrupedal um, movement. Quadrupedal movement. Um, so that they walk then on all four, whereas us, we are bipedal, which means two limbs. Okay, so let's have a look at the actual differences. All right, so there are specific characteristics that we look at, and it's important to know these. The first one would be the position of the foramen magnum, so that we need to look at that. The second um, characteristic we look at is, is the spine, the shape of the spine. The third characteristic we have a look at is um, the pelvis, the size and the shape of the pelvis. And then we have a look at the size of the cranium. Okay, and that also is different. And then again at the dentition. And those characteristics then um, are what, or those are the things that have changed um, due to the fact that humans have become bipedal and the rest of primates are still quadrupeds. Okay, so let's have a look at the first one, the foramen magnum, which means large hole. <coughs> Sorry, so if we have a look, in, in, the di in photograph number four here, we can see this is a human cranium or a human skull. And here we can see this is where the foramen magnum is, as opposed to um, if we have a look at an ape um, cranium, there we can see where the foramen magnum is. So we have, we have specific terminology that we use when we, when we look at the human one, we say it is in a more forward position. We don't talk about center in the middle, we talk more forward position. And that then allows the spinal cord to enter vertically. Whereas in apes, their foramen magnum 
is in a more backward position and that is important because they are quadrupeds. So that um, the, the shape of their spine um, and their head is positioned there. So in other words, the, the foramen magnum would be in a more backward position, whereas humans, it's going to be in the middle. Okay. Right. Okay, so now we're looking specifically at the spine, and that is proof of bipedalism. And as I said, the spine of a human is, we talk about it as being more curved. So we say it is more curved because you can see it's, um, it curves that way and then it goes back to, goes outwards and then inwards and then outwards again. So we talk about curved or we say it is S-shaped. Whereas if we have a look at um, the ape, the, the spine of an ape, we talk about it as being C-shaped or we say it is less curved. All right, so that's then C-shaped. All right, so now we've had a look at the foramen magnum and we've looked at the spine. Now we're going to have a look at the difference in the pelvic girdle. And that is um, the attachment to which our lower limbs are attached. Okay, so in a gorilla, we talk about the, spine, the pelvis being long and narrow. So if you have a look at the first two diagrams here, you can see um, we've got a very long pelvis and it's a lot narrower. Okay, then if you compare it to a human pelvis, it's shorter. So we talk about it shorter, but it is wider. So the important terminology here um, when we use, when we describe the differences, we say um, shorter, so it's short and wide. We must use those words when we describe the human pelvis. When we talk about an ape pelvis, we talk about it being long and we talk about narrow. Okay, so those are important terminology. So when we, when we do... Um, answer these kind of questions in the exams, it's very important that we use the correct terminology. Right, then the next um, difference we're going to have a look at is the brain size and the, obviously then the size of the cranium. And remember, the skull is the whole structure that forms the head. But when we talk about the cranium, we're only talking about the part that houses the brain. So it's just this part. It's not the facial bones, because um, then that makes up the rest of the skull. It's just the brain box um, or the cranium that houses the brain. Okay, so that's the part where the brain is found. And the larger the cranium, the larger the brain. Okay, and here if we have a look at, we have, this is a chimp. Uh, brain or crane, uh, skull and we can see the cranium here is much smaller than this one of Homo sapiens. Can you see how much larger the cranium is? So that means all of that capacity, the volume in there is much more than we find in this segment here. Okay. And then when the last thing that we're going to have a look at is dentition. So dentition is the teeth so it has to do with the teeth, and here we can have, we have a look at uh, an ape, um, the, the teeth of an ape. We can see the difference. Here we're having a look at the teeth of um, humans, um, and we have a look at this diagram at, um, at the bottom here, and we can see um, there's various differences in this diagram um, between human um, and gorilla. And what we see here is that here we have very large canines, we also have a space, um, the shape of the, the palate and the jaw is more U-shaped, whereas if you have a look in humans, our canines are very small, okay, so they're not as large, there's no gaps, the, the palate and the, the jaw shape is more um, an arch, more of a C or an arch shape, um, so it's, it's, very, it's very different. Okay, so to sum up then, um, in a little table, uh, you, you, it's easy to learn, to study. So if we have a look at the different features, if we're looking at um, the cranium, in humans there's a much larger cranium or large brain, whereas in African apes it's much smaller. Brow ridges, 
They're not well developed in humans, whereas they're quite prominent and well developed in, in um, apes. The spine, we said, is more curved or S-shaped, whereas in apes it's less curved. The pelvic girdle is short and wide, whereas in apes it's long and narrow. Um, the canines, if we have a look, are small, whereas they are large. Um, and then the arrangement of the teeth, there's very small gaps or no gaps, whereas in apes there's much larger gaps. The palate shape is small and semicircular, whereas that's long and rectangular. The jaws are small, less prognathous, so they don't stick out or protrude as much, whereas in apes, more prognathous. And the cranial ridges, humans don't have any, whereas they are across the top of the cranium. And the foramen magnum, we said, is in a more forward position, whereas it's in a backward position for apes. Okay, and that's all we have time for today. I hope you enjoyed the lesson, and we'll see you again next time.